Good morning. Um, I am Michael Donovan, and I am uh, an MAS board member. Uh, as we begin this conversation about cities, it gives me great pleasure to introduce my friend, Richard or Saul Worman. Richard uh, is, uh, is a once-in-a-generation thinker who often claims he isn't. His, uh, his quest to understand, to, to make the complex understandable, has been uh, what Richard claims is his great failing. I'm happy to report that we are all beneficiaries of his failing, his need to understand. I have to tell you, Richard is having a pretty good week. Uh, last night, he received the Cooper Hewitt's Lifetime Achievement Award presented by Richard's lifetime friend, Frank Gehry. The award was for a career encompassing, encompassing his work as an architect, Louis Kahn was his mentor, a cartographer, a teacher, a graphic designer, an urban designer, an information theorist. As many of you know, Richard pioneered and literally created a new discipline called information architects. Richard's also an author. Um, he's credited with 83 books. We were discussing this morning, 33 are about cities, mapping and planning, uh, soon to be 84 books. Um, and then, this is this week, Richard's off to Dublin, where on Sunday, Saturday, sorry, Trinity College is presenting him with a gold medal for outstanding contribution to public discourse. This is an honor shared by uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu and Winston Churchill, so Richard is in pretty good company. As you, as you know, Richard's curiosity, he would say ignorance, led him to found TED, followed by TED Med, and finally EG. Um, all are experiments in bringing people together, sharing information in an effort to understand. One would say that Richard has invented the way to gather and people and to continue to challenge that model. He's continued to challenge that module, model. Uh, just a few weeks ago, uh, he hosted WWW, his latest iteration. He invited a number of the brightest minds on the planet to indulge him and his audience in what Richard describes as intellectual jazz. My wife and partner, Nancy Green, who I have to tell you has attended every conference Richard has ever conceived, observed it was unquestionably the greatest conference Richard has ever done. So I'm helpful that Richard will share one of his latest endeavors, a partnership with Ezra called 192021. There's some posters and cards that are being passed out. It represents a major cartographic initiative with an extraordinary partner that endeavors to standardize the methodology for comparative urban data, certainly of great interest to all of us who are passionate about cities. Please join me in welcoming my friend, Richard Saltwerman. Yeah, I see. No, I, I, the, the sun is going back there. I planned that. That's why the former speech was a little too long for me. But it just got the sun moving right there. So they're going to see me, see. Uh, I thought, is it better if I walk over here? Is it? Uh, is it, is the sun less if I'm standing here? No? About the same? Okay, well. A cardiographic initiative it sounds pretty boring. And, um, but it's, it's been my passion for a long time to understand cities. And um, there, there is a poster. I know you don't need more paper, and it looks like an advertisement. It isn't. I would love you to pick one of these up. Some people have. Uh, it's a poster that was done two years ago, and the back of it is interesting. Um, and this was an homage that Esri did. And I'd like you to pick one up. You'll enjoy having it. And this little card. I'm not asking for any money or anything else. Don't worry about it. I'm not a charity, and I don't want any help in that way. Um, but it was an homage that uh, Esri is the largest map-making company in the world, and they, they're located in uh, in Redlands, California, and the owner of that is a wonderful gentleman by the name of Jack Dangerman, and they do maps for everybody, National Geographic, the CIA, this, that, and the other thing. 
And he, along with radical media, uh, John Kamen's radical media, which did Fog of War and does a lot of programming you've seen, and myself have this initiative called 192021. And it's sort of a clever title. It's not really what it's about. But originally, it was going to be that I thought to understand cities, I had to look at 19 of the largest cities of the world, 19 of the cities that would have more than 20 million people in the 21st century, and develop a way of collecting and describing uh, information comparably from city to city. Now, in, I'm 77. I know I look much younger. <laughs> but I'm 77, and when I, 51 years ago or so, I did my first book. I did my first two books. One was on Lucan, and one was on cities. And um, what I did is I did models of 50 cities of the world out of plasticine, low plasticine models, all to the same scale. And it was shocking. It was surprisingly informative. It doesn't sound like much. I mean, it's a pretty dumb idea. But when I saw the relationship of size to cities, all of a sudden, I understood a surprising, it was surprisingly informative. And the next time I went to Paris or Rome, I understood them better. I understood how much bigger Paris was than Rome. How, what New York was like next to, to, to Tokyo. Or how big, that Versailles is as big as downtown Philadelphia. Or the core of Washington. I just had a sense of how to access and understand. And that was just a teeny bit of information. A few years later, I did a mega book. It was this book, big, and every fold out page is bigger than my arm. An urban atlas, a comparative urban, first the urban comparative atlas of major American cities. Did 20 cities, and it was before computers. It was published by MIT. It's sort of a rare book now. You can't find it. I only have two copies. Um, in doing that book, I went around the United States on a 20th century fund grant, and I collected all the maps and all the city planning stuff from every, all these cities. This was done in 1966 and 67, so it's a long time ago again, before computers. And I saw that when I listed the land use things, that are the little legends on the bottom of the maps of uh, a commercial, industrial, mixed use, this use, the list was this long, that you really couldn't compare one city to another city. There was no way of comparing the numbers that you were talking about actually to another city. You can have the number of buildings, but not in context. Now, we all know this thing that they're talking about, that over 50% of the population in, of the world lives in urbanized areas. The UN did that, said that two or three years ago. But what is an urbanized area? Does New York stop with the five boroughs, or does it leak into New Jersey and Connecticut? What is the definition of an urbanized area? Well, you can say, why do you need to know what a border to a city is? Well, any of the numbers that are collected about population or economics, if you don't have an area, you can't show a density. You can't compare the quality of air, the amount of crime, education, or anything else if you don't have an area within which to put those numbers. I hope I'm not losing this audience, but it's a very simple piece of information that you learn in grammar school of how do you show density. That does not exist. Tokyo, which we were compared with in, as a model city in, in the former speech, has 45 million people about, 45.8 million people, they quote. But there's actually six official maps of Tokyo putting together different prefectures that go from 8.3 million to 45. So which is Tokyo? What are we really comparing? If you wanted to locate a Toyota factory someplace, because somebody gave you great tax benefits, and you got the two biggest tax benefits, and one is Shanghai and one is Sao Paulo, I'm making that up, you couldn't compare those two cities about anything, about how far it is to get to work, how long does it take, what the population is made of, how much are they educated, crime, anything. You can't compare them. This is a, a group that talks about urbanized areas. And if I went around this room and I said, how big is an acre? A common 
a common word in our language. Probably somebody here would come up with the fact that, well, they live on two acres or three acres. Of course, that wouldn't have any meaning to anybody else. So somebody would say, well, an acre is 43,560 square feet because you learned that in grammar school, which then doesn't have any image in your head because you can't understand what 43,560 square feet is in your head. But if I tell you an acre is about the size of a football field, just slightly smaller, you'll never forget it. When you see it, you, know, you don't have to play football to understand what a football field is like. And that's what an acre is. So from now on in your life, you will always know if somebody says an acre, it's about a football field. That's what it's like. You only understand something relative to something you understand. And that's basically at the ground roots of what I'm trying to do, is allow you to understand something relative to something else you might understand and to have information collected and displayed in a manner that you can start understanding. And understanding precedes action. I am not saying any of the action that was just described by you, sir, or later on by you, Amanda, aren't good projects. But similarly, if you all spoke Finnish and I'm speaking English, we wouldn't be communicating. And it seems like we should take advantage of what other people are doing and understanding what other projects are other places and understanding what we are to the rest of the world. And when we display who we are, being who New Yorkers are to the rest of the world, in order to encourage people to move here, pay money here, buy things here, purchase it, they should understand the advantages or disadvantages. They should understand honestly what is the fabric. We should be speaking the same language. It's that simple. If you had a course in Shakespeare, you'd want to be able to speak English. And, and that would be that would be the fabric. Now, this is very primitive, what I'm talking about. And the back of this poster says that understanding precedes action. I suspect it does. I was sitting next to Michelle Obama because she made an announcement in the White House because of this award that they announced that I got. And uh, she gave a, a, a little talk. And she came back and I said, there's just two things I would like to uh, do uh, while we sit and talk. And she was charming, more charming than I thought she'd be. And she was really charming. And um, I, I said, one is a, uh, a piece of politicking and the other is I want to critique your talk because nobody will critique people's talks. And I am fascinated with how people talk. I would be happy to give you a critique later on if you like. <laughs> uh, I once gave a talk in Chicago. I was the fourth speaker, and I decided on that, I don't use notes, obviously, but I decided what I would do for my speech is critique the three speeches before me. <laughs> Two of the people that I've become very friendly with, and one has not talked to me again. <laughs> and the two really changed the way they spoke. And nobody talks to you. Everybody will say, you did a great job. Oh, that was wonderful. Nobody tells you the truth. No, I mean, you probably asked each other today, how's it going, keep them busy, all crap. I mean, it's just stupid <laughs> stuff, right? I just so much believe in telling the truth. I just really believe in having a conversation with people. There should be four more rows of people. We should be close to the stage. What is this area that I'm standing in here? <laughs> What's it for? I mean, it's for nothing. And the room, is symmetrical, and that's to one side. It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> that's not design. I spoke here once before, and I, I moved all the furniture in the stage. Uh, but I, I, was, I was younger then, but only by a couple of years. <laughs> so now if you collect all this information and you make it understandable, and you collect it in ways that are understandable, and that the maps are clear, and the questions you ask of the maps are clear, then all of this stuff can go in something that we're, I'm announcing. Please pick these up on the way out, because this card is the first, and this is a big deal for me today. I mean, this is really a big deal. I've never given a speech in New York to this kind of crowd. Um, 
I live in Newport, Rhode Island, and I, I'm a schlepper from Philly originally. Um, this, uh, this little card is the first announcement. This is the first time we're doing this. Uh, we're announcing that in July, we're going to build out the first urban observatory. Now, my fantasy is that maybe 20, 30, 40, 50 cities in the world have urban observatories. If you can picture a room that just has flat panels, in a, I'll just say, so it's easy in your head, a big circular room, and there's flat panels around them, nice room. And there's a console there, and there's some questions. You can ask questions, and they come up on these screens, and every screen is a different city. And they all come up comparatively. And you can see the world and see the relationship of one city to another. Now, you know you can go further. You could have live panels, and you could see festivals in every city, and you could see other things, and another room that had a deeper piece of information on the city that you were in, and stuff of that sort. But a live, connected museum of urbanism around the world, where people could understand each other, could, in a sense, talk to each other without even talking the same language, because we talk to each other through, often through maps. They could talk to each other. And connected to that is another room, which is a room called FedMed, which has the countries that those cities are in talking about their health care policy. I, I, a couple years ago, I was, I was uh, running a conference. I created another one called uh, TedMed. And I had the point person for the Obama administration, Zeke Emanuel, on the stage. And I was not allowed to ask him about Obamacare. But I said, do you know what's happening or what the healthcare systems are like in Norway or India or this? And they said, no, no, we don't look at that. Well, I find that really astonishing. And I would assume that New York looks at what other cities are doing for their planning. And I would assume countries look at other countries of what they're doing for healthcare policy. So I did a little wheel, which asked five questions. I mean, just a simple question like maternity leave. Maternity leave in the United States is 12 weeks unpaid. Norway, 46 weeks paid. India, 12 weeks paid. I mean, it's completely different in any city. And the two huge businesses that come out of that, talking commercially, and there's some commercial people, some people are talking about being bankers before or doing something like that. Uh, the two big businesses that come out of that are what nations are doing and what they're not doing. The opposites are both big businesses. Isn't that fascinating? I find that fascinating that it's not readily available. That that isn't just parlance. That isn't just what you would want to have. Trust me, they don't have it. And by the way, the maps that I'm talking about, comparative maps of cities, the CIA doesn't have it. And I've gone down to talk to Fred Smith. He doesn't have it. And he delivers little packages everywhere for FedEx. I mean, he owns the company. Um, he doesn't really deliver them. And he, has big, and he has big, big globes in his office, so he likes maps. So after I did uh, this first comparative statistic, it's called Urban Atlas, 20 American cities. I did my own. Uh, I, was, uh, I had moved to New York then. I lived here eight years. And I bought a little house, uh, sort of a terminally cute house in the Hamptons, and uh, was on the wrong side of the highway. But I was told to be a player, you had to have a little house, and I had a little house in the Hamptons. And um, I had to drive back and forth. And I didn't have a car up to then, so I got a car. And I got, I got a Rand McNally Road Atlas, because that's what you had. And then I started wanting to drive other places. And I realized that in the Rand McNally Road Atlas, one of the most pa popular paperback book for a long time, now it's probably less because of your, you hold it in your hand and crash into other cars. Um, <laughs> what, what we. Uh, that a small state takes up a page, and a big state takes up a page. So there's a time warp between states. Every map is a different scale. I mean, isn't that madness? It's madness. So I did my own, at own I, I don't have a publisher. I don't have a staff. I just do things. And, and it, it's partly because uh, uh, what's what, it's, it's what my, my, my good friend said that I say that my long suit is my ignorance. I do things because I can't understand things. And if you go into a publisher and say, I'd like to do a, a, a book about uh, health care and I don't know anything about it, they're not going to give you an advance. <laughs> I mean, why would they? Uh, I've done seven books on health care. 
Uh, I get some corporations to do it. J&J gives me lots of money. Um, I'm, not, uh, I'm not whining, honestly. I'm doing fine. Um, anyway, so I did my own road atlas where I made the maps off, off of the same scale. And you could actually find your way around the United States. And, uh, and I did it for people. Every page was 250 miles square. The grid was 50 miles square. What is a 50 miles square? 50 miles square is an hour. 250 miles is what you sort of drive in a day if you drive five. five days. And then I had little squares within that, and it went to maps that were 25 miles square, centering on the cities. What is 25 miles? That's 12 and a half miles to the centroid. That's when you make basically the decision to drive in or around the city. And then I did maps five miles square. That's the core of a city, and you can see street names and hotels and restaurants and things of that sort. It had to do with people. And that's all. This is, I, I like the name of this room because my last conference, which I just finished, was called Intellectual Jazz. I had two couches that faced each other. The speakers didn't face the audience. I put two people here. I sat here, and I posed, and they didn't know each other sometimes. They knew of each other, it was fancy people. And um, I posed a premise to them, and they just had a conversation. Behind them was just a concrete wall. It was intellectual jazz. It was, pe I, when I began the conference the first night, I said, this is the great leap backwards. <laughs> because this conference could have taken place 2,500 years ago in an amphitheater with Plato and Aristotle having a chat. And isn't that what I think this, I know they're gonna show some stuff on the screen when it gets darker, but you should really just talk to each other. And the best part of this meeting and any meeting is just talking to each other. Uh, just being able to, you know, we don't have computers that can nod, and therefore we can't really talk to our computers. And um, so, anyway, the first urban observatory is gonna be in July. We're gonna build, if you can think of these two things, it's gonna be in San Diego, because that's where ESRI has their users conference. And 16,000 uh, cartographers from 150 countries come to this meeting. 16,000 is a lot of people. Um, I gave it the keynote there a couple years ago. And, uh, to present this initial idea, and now we're gonna build it out. And uh, we have several, uh, this little postcard, Jack is going around the world giving these to people. We have Rio on board. I hope New York gets on board and be, wants to be one of the cities. Our proof of concept, we got some money, we did a proof of concept, and we used three cities. Uh, and uh, one was New York, and so we have a lot of stuff on New York. Uh, and we did Tokyo, and we compared them. And then, uh, was it Dubai or Abu Dhabi? I always get confused which owns which and which is which, but they, uh, we had them and they, they did their own comparative thing. So we have Abu Dhabi or Dubai and uh, Tokyo and New York City in depth compared. It's fascinating, it's really fascinating. So you'll say yes, New York will come on board, won't you? Yes, of course you will. And, um, um, and we hope to get maybe 10 cities for this first demo. We've already done proof of concept in slides. We want to now do a proof of concept of this urban observatory. And wouldn't it be nice to go places and be able to see yourself relative to all the cities in the world with a section deeply on your city, also to the same scale? Uh, just think about language. Think about how you communicate with somebody else. At this, at this meeting that I just held, there was a, I had an astrophysicist, the he's head of the Jupiter, uh, the, the, the big thing, that the spaceship, the Jupiter, and I had somebody who worked on CERN and uh, uh, micro, you know, small particle physics. And you would think, well, they must share something in common. They even look at the table of elements differently. You have this fiction that you think doctors talk the same language in different fields? Not. They don't. The astrophysicist looks at the table of, of, of elements as being uh, the light elements are helium and hydrogen, and all the rest are called heavy elements. 
oh, I never heard of such a thing. I mean, to me, they just kept on going up, right? They have, you see how many of each thing there are in each one, and you, you think they have a progression. And then they have some families of elements. So even at the scientific level in our society, people don't talk the same language. From running Ted Med, and I've done these books, Understanding Healthcare, and books on heart disease, and I'm trained as an architect, by the way, but uh, on all these different things and diagnostic tests for men and women and all the, the different fields call things differently. And that's why if you go from department to department in a hospital because something's going wretchedly wrong with you or they're trying to find what's wrong with you, they don't really necessarily talk the same language or measure things the same way. You know, there is this perhaps apocryphal story about the large pool at the um, Cipriani in, in, uh, in Venice that they built it from drawings that were, uh, they got the meters and the feet wrong. And so they built it in meters and it was, the drawings were in feet, so it's nine times bigger than it should be. Um, well, that happens. So this is my plea. I'd love you to pick up one of these things there. Uh, one of the posters, it's a little big, the postcard is small. There's, going to, there's a URL up, we just posted it, but we're gonna add to it massively over the next uh, months because the, it's just an, it's almost a placeholder. That's all on the, uh, the card. I see I have to stop soon, I know that. Um, <laughs> but I haven't bored myself yet, so I won't get off. <laughs> And uh, I would love you to go to the URL. You're welcome to, I mean, I answer my own phone and I, I don't have a staff. And, uh, and if you want to send me an email and, and chat or do something, it's just rsw at worman.com. That's easy, W-U-R-M-A-N, you have a program, you can see how it's spelled. And uh, those are my initials, Richard Saul Worman. And uh, I, I would really like to do this. I would, I, this is my passion. Uh, to understand cities of the world and understand them relative. And it's not to stop any of the good projects, bicycle paths or bigger projects that people are doing. It's not to stop them, but it would be nice to know what they are relative to other places. And that you can't just transfer something that they're doing in Helsinki because it looks good there, here, unless you understand it in context. And we don't. We simply don't, and we think we do. People think because Google Maps is out there, we have maps to the same scale. We don't. And we don't have the proper GIS information. There's no GIS information really on Google Maps or anybody else's maps. But Esri is GIS and Landsat. John Kamen knows how to make things attractive and good and, and uh, beautiful, and he knows the media and I'm the conscience. And uh, thank you very much for listening to me this morning. <laughs>